uh, told a bit about Negawatt, but maybe not so much about me. I've been an um, expert on uh, nuclear issues, mm -hmm. energy issues, uh, energy transition uh, for uh, more than 25 years now, working uh, more in France, but also on the uh, European and uh, international level. And uh, I've been, uh, like, since 2006, I think, on a voluntary basis and uh, uh, as part of the staff since for, uh, for uh, six years now, uh, a member of Negawatt. Uh, and I will start by uh, saying a, a, a little more about Negawatt than uh, what David said. Uh, we are a French think tank uh, created in uh, 2001, a uh, non-profit, uh, independent group of uh, experts, only, uh, uh, only uh, part of it as, uh, on an individual basis, uh, mostly field pr practitioners. Um, we have uh, uh, like 20 plus or minus employees and an active core of uh, 50 people active uh, like in the board or as ambassadors of uh, Negawatt uh, and a, a lot of uh, individual members. And, uh, from the beginning, as David said, we are producing uh, sustainable energy scenarios uh, for France. We have produced five of them, and I will uh, talk about the latest one, which we published in uh, October uh, 2021. And of course, we are using this scenario to uh, engage in uh, the political debate about policies and measures, both proposing our own and also criticizing those of uh, other players. Um, it's uh, important that for us that we are really uh, uh, connected uh, through a group with, with subsidiaries to uh, uh, like entities that are acting on the ground. We have an Institut Negawatt, which is uh, uh, mostly uh, accompanying uh, local communities or, uh, or businesses in implementing uh, energy transition uh, solutions. And uh, it's uh, also... Uh, uh, served to uh, develop a startup called Doremi. Uh, for, for those of you uh, who understand French, it's Dispositif Opérationnel de Rénovation des Maisons Individuelles. So it tells what it's about. It's about uh, deep retrofitting of uh, individual houses. And again, the idea is uh, to uh, be connected to uh, massifying um, energy uh, transition solutions. Uh, we are also uh, increasingly active on the European level, and I will talk of this uh, European work uh, toward the uh, end of my uh, presentation. Um, we've developed a project on our own with, uh, with uh, partners called Clever. I'll come back to that, but I also want to mention that we are actively uh, 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 working in a Horizon 2020 project called Fulfill which is about uh, what sufficiency lifestyles mean to reach 1.5 degrees uh, objectives. Um, I will start by explaining how we understand the uh, global uh, context or the global uh, uh, energy uh, issue. Uh, starting with this, it's very uh, simple. It, these are just uh, basic representations that usually come to mind when uh, we uh, speak about energy on one hand, on the left, uh, energy resources, which we uh, take from the environment, whether it's fossil fuels or wind or uh, uranium for, uh, for nuclear power. And uh, on the right, uh, on the other hand, uh, services that we draw from using energy, like, uh, like moving in cars, like uh, uh, using appliances, heating our homes, uh, and uh, using, uh, using uh, uh, machines to, uh, in, uh, in, man in, in manufacturing industry, for instance. Uh, my point here is to highlight that there's a lot of complexity between those resources and those services. And that this complexity, which is what we should call the energy system as a whole, um, is uh, both, uh, I mean, it, it, it's the result of some choices a long time, explicit or implicit. We uh, choose, for instance, to develop our mobility based on the use of cars and based on a model where we are owners of our cars. It has been a constructed choice. Um, and these choices and this system are framing our society. I usually uh, 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 
say uh, energy is a system and this system frames society. And uh, car is an example, but whatever uh, thing you uh, try to uh, grasp on, it's the same. But think about how cars uh, uh, frame our urban planning, our industry, uh, our uh, lifestyle, the budget of households, and so on and so forth. So when uh, we talk about changes, <coughs> whether it's in the way we are using uh, energy, but even mostly in the way we are uh, drawing energy from the environment, the choice we made regarding resources, it intrinsically means changes in the global system. And that is what the uh, uh, wording energy transition comes from. I mean, it's about shifting from the current system based on this energy mix and this uh, techno-economic uh, uh, framing to another system. But it means it's not only a kind of a, a engineers or technical issue, it's really a social and therefore political uh, uh, matter. That's the first level of uh, systemic complexity. The second one is that, of course, this energy system makes our own economy not sustainable. Uh, we have climate change, of course, we have depletion of uh, uh, fossil, uh, fossil resources, we have uh, many pollutions, technological risks, whether it's uh, uh, with oil or uh, the specific risks of uh, nuclear. We have, and it should be written there, uh, I realized that uh, uh, recently uh, the uh, kind of collapse of biodiversity or at least the uh, deep threat to bio biodiversity. And we also have, regarding access to these resources, both uh, all the geopolitical tensions that arise from uh, competition to these resources and access to energy issues, which uh, are uh, obvious on the global level, more than 1 billion, 200, uh, 200 million people don't have access to electricity, for instance. But it's also true in a country like France, where uh, at least 12 million people uh, find themselves in uh, energy poverty. So uh, we have a lot of issues and a, a, a last slight uh, touch of complexity. Energy is never alone on any of, the, of these issues. Climate change is also... Uh, uh, agriculture and some industrial processes, uh, technological risk uh, or, or pollutions also come from a chemical industry, for instance. Uh, depletion of resources is increasingly a concern for uh, metallic ones and so on and so forth. So uh, all this really calls for, a, uh, for a, a deep change of the system if we mean to make it sustainable and that has really been uh, what Negawatt has been concerned uh, from the beginning. Uh, it took us time and uh, it actually uh, really came with uh, our latest scenario to really, uh, I mean, to, to acknowledge publicly how much uh, our work was uh, obviously technical, but to a large extent political, in the sense that it's based on core values that we share. I'm not going through them, they are uh, kind of uh, humanist ones, uh, you could say, uh, and it's based on this idea to uh, put these values into action uh, to uh, uh, reach objectives in the long term, rooted in uh, our uh, ground uh, expertise, uh, and to, uh, through a technical scenario, to uh, develop the ambition of a more peaceful, sustainable, and fair society. And uh, We've decided to, uh, to uh, make it more concrete, uh, to use the uh, matrix of the uh, 17 uh, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, both as a guide to uh, develop our methodology and uh, develop our assumptions and scenario, and also uh, as a, an ending point to uh, try to assess the uh, impact of the scenario on sustainability uh, as, a, as a global thing. It's uh, important to uh, have in mind, to keep in mind that the UN, uh, when they adopted this uh, framework 
insisted on the fact that it's an integrated and in indivisible matrix. In other words, it doesn't make sense to care about climate change if that has negative impacts on other sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, having said that, I'm uh, going into uh, what we call the Negawatt approach, the way we have developed through time uh, uh, reasoning to uh, implement or to uh, elaborate scenarios. And uh, I will uh, start by illustrating it um, through, uh, I'm illustrating this systematic change of systemic perspective uh, through uh, uh, an example of uh, what we call an energy chain, which uh, links an energy resource, in that case oil, with a use, which will be uh, lighting. Um, just to uh, illustrate what is at stake at different steps. So we start with the primary energy that is oil. We need to refine it, starting with, to uh, uh, be able to burn it in uh, a power plant. Because if we want some light at the end, we need electricity. We are not using uh, uh, oil uh, directly uh, in light uh, since uh, a very long term, uh, a long time. Sorry. So here comes the first losses, of course, and especially in the uh, uh, power plant where uh, only 40% at most of the uh, energy used is uh, turned uh, into electricity to the grid. You need then to deliver this electricity to, to end users through uh, the electric grid with uh, some more, a few percents of losses. And then you need to convert this electricity into a useful form of energy. We used to say we are uh, consuming electricity. We actually don't do anything with electricity as such. It serves to create light or mechanical force or, uh, or uh, uh, heat or cold, which we use uh, to provide us with services. Uh, so we need conversion equipments, uh, in that case a light bulb, and that is of, uh, of course on purpose because this, is th this light bulb is probably uh, one of the major uh, factors of social progress in the, uh, in the last century, but from an energy uh, perspective, it's really inefficient. I don't know if you know how much of the uh, electricity is lost, but it's 95%. Only 5% is turned into uh, light, which shows that uh, in many cases, we, uh, I mean, in most cases, not as much, but uh, we uh, have a potential for more efficient converters. Uh, when you turn to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, LED lighting, uh, you uh, gain a ratio of 7 to 10 in the, uh, in the uh, uh, conversion performance. Uh, that's not yet the end of uh, the energy chain. Uh, the, last, the next step is how we design and uh, dimension our lighting equipments. Uh, the example here is the, uh, what, what is called the uh, lampadaire boule in French. Uh, very nice, I mean, from an aesthetic point of view, it's cool. Again, from an energetic point of view, it's really bad because most of the light is sent upwards <laughs> when we need it on the ground. Uh, and again, that means a lot of losses, uh, which are as important in terms of global ratio than the losses in the beginning of the chain. Okay, and then the conditions of use are important. Uh, this uh, example shows uh, urban uh, light, equipped with an efficient bulb, equipped to uh, send the light uh, on, uh, on, on, on the street, but which is using electricity for no service given the uh, level of natural light. And this, I mean, you, it seems obvious when you take it step by step on an example, but you can apply the same reasoning to any of our energy uses. And uh, that's where we start from to say we need to revert the way we are used to think about energy. We are used to think about resources and availability of resources. Uh, our point is that the core, the, 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 the reason 
uh, for uh, developing an energy system is not using resources. It's delivering services. And therefore, we think that to rethink the energy system starts with rethinking energy services. Yes? Uh, just a question on that. Like, what's the conversion loss? Um, because uh, in renewables, the energy is right there in the form of electricity. Yeah. As for fossil fuels, it has to be converted into electricity, uh, which plays a lot into primary energy, if I'm not wrong. So yeah, well, I mean. Conversion loss normally of like oil or so, to turn it into electricity. Um, I'm, so I, I didn't get, I, I voluntarily didn't get into numbers because if you want to put numbers here, you need to bring uh, accountancy conventions. Um, and I mean, what you refer to regarding the difference between fossil fuels and uh, renewables comes with, uh, I mean, the, the ratio between what we call primary energy, so that the uh, intrinsic energy value we are taking from the environment and uh, the final energy that is delivered to, uh, to, to, to users or at least delivered to the grid by, uh, by a power plant. And um, I mean, in, in, in the case of fossil fuels, uh, there's an intrinsic uh, primary energy uh, content. You know, we, you, you, you've heard of a, 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 a ton oil equivalent, which means the energy that a ton of oil would provide if it's perfectly burnt. Okay, so we can put a definitive number there. Uh, and then you have, for instance, in a power plant like that, when you burn oil to have electricity, uh, f somehow 40% ratio. Uh, when you do the same with uh, with uh, uh, uranium, for instance, uh, you have an issue with the uh, primary content of the uranium because it's not intrinsic. It's th there's no such thing as the perfect burning of a ton of uranium. It depends on how you enrich it in the ty type of reactor you are using it and so on, uh, which means you can only uh, put a number in terms of energy once it's... Uh, uh, delivers heat in the reactor and then one third of the heat is turned into electricity so the ratio would be 33 percent and in the case of renewables uh, you have losses uh, in the conversion of light into electricity uh, on a solar panel you have losses in a way on the conversion of the, the, the force of wind into electricity but we don't put a ratio there in, in, in con conventions because, I mean, it's not actually lost. It's just that the, the, the solar panel needs maybe to receive 10 times more light than it provides electricity. But this light is reflected. It's, I, I mean, the energy is not lost like it is lost when you're burning uh, uh, a finite, finite resource. Uh, so, in, in the case of wind or PV, the ratio would be uh, 100%, which obviously uh, creates a lot of uh, trouble when you want to make a global accountancy of the, 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 the performance of the system. But all this doesn't change the fact that when you start with a primary energy resource and get to an energy service, service you have a lot of steps where you have losses. And it is important to reduce those losses because it's the, uh, not the only, but the, really the most important way to make the system more sustainable. Uh, yeah. Is it different from conversion efficiency? Because for PVs also there's going to be some like 25% of the percentage. You mean the efficiency of the, of the PV panel? I mean, again, we, you can improve the uh, efficiency of the PV panel. I mean, it, it's that, that will improve its economic performance. But from an energy point of view, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, in, again, in conventions, it's not relevant to account for the amount of light that was needed to provide this electricity. So whatever the uh, performance of the PV panel is, you will, you will consider that it used a primary energy 
that is equal to the final energy it delivers in the, forms of, in, in the form of electricity. Okay? But efficiency is obviously a, a very important word, which brings me back to, uh, to uh, my line. Um, so, I was saying we, uh, our proposal globally is that we start by focusing on energy services instead of resources and, and therefore think of the global system backwards. Uh, and that is what we have been calling uh, for a long time uh, sufficiency, sobriété uh, in French, uh, which uh, used to be a very uh, controversial word, uh, which is uh, more accepted now, which doesn't mean it's implemented. That's uh, another uh, part of the discussion. But what we call by sufficiency is really uh, this cleverness on why, how, uh, we are using energy, what energy services we really want. Okay. It's not about, uh, about constraints or uh, uh, losing freedom, etc. For us, it's really about, on the contrary, uh, being more aware and more in capacity of choosing what we are using energy for. Then, of course, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it doesn't come in... Uh, such a linear logic when you apply it uh, to the uh, global system. But it, in, in terms of reasoning, you need to uh, redimension and prioritize energy services first through sufficiency before you think about applying efficiency, which will be about reducing losses all along the chain um, and uh, improving uh, uh, conversion and so on performances. And you uh, will end with substitution of resources. Um, I could have put a graph, uh, I didn't put it, but you probably all have in mind the kind of graph showing the uh, incredible increase of the use of energy uh, over, uh, over uh, the past century. Uh, one thing that is no to, to be noticed on that kind of graph that uh, often comes on the... On, on on, uh, on the second level, is that it's not only an increase and a, and, a, and a sharp and incredible increase, it's also a story of addition. Uh, and you could say to some extent addiction, but uh, it's an addition of resources. Uh, fossil fuels have not substituted uh, wood and uh, traditional biomass, and renewables or nuclear have not substituted fossil fuels. We are piling up resources and uh, uh, we know, especially uh, in the face of uh, climate change, that what we need to do now, because yes, there are planetary boundaries, is to substitute and start adding. And uh, managing the level of demand is, of course, key to be able to substitute. I mean, if you had, and, and that is what we see actually on the, uh, on the uh, world level. I mean, we, you, you, uh, renewables have, are really uh, developing increasingly fast and faster and faster. But uh, we probably only now, 2023, uh, 2024, come to the point where they develop fast enough so that it's faster than demand. And so that they start to contract fossil fuels. But it took a long time because there was not enough policy on demand. And uh, so if you, if you want to get to a substitution of resources that you consider less sustainable by some you consider more sustainable, the key to get there is to, uh, ha to act on demand first. Um, our scenario is uh, uh, on, uh, on, on France, metropolitan France. Just uh, a quick word about the uh, current situation. Uh, we are using almost 90% of non-renewable resources. Uh, and uh, we are, I mean, like in, uh, in many, uh, many countries, we are using it for, uh, uh, for uh, all, uh, all sectors. Uh, one important thing maybe to mention is that when it comes to final energy consumption, fossil fuels are still contributing to more than 60% of uh, 
uh, of energy consumption in France compared to 67% on, uh, on a world scale, which shows you how much but also how little our choice to develop nuclear power to a point that is uh, not uh, matched in any uh, country has uh, allowed to get rid of uh, fossil fuels. Significantly, but not much altogether. Um, we uh, uh, work a lot in our modeling, but I'll go faster with that uh, on, uh, uh, I mean, making sure we are as comprehensive, as consistent as possible. Uh, that means from a physical point of view, we are modeling not only energy and greenhouse gas, uh, emissions through the uh, Negawatt model, but also uh, uh, all uh, land use and uh, uh, biomaterials uh, issues through uh, uh, a modeling developed by, uh, called AFTER, developed by another NGO, uh, Solagro, but we are coupling uh, the models and we have developed uh, another model called Negamat, which is a model of the uh, raw material footprint of the French economy. And we are, again, coupling those uh, models. We are working on a French level, but we are very much concerned uh, both by what happens on a local level in territories. We are concerned with the fact that our scenario much makes sense on that level, much makes sense in terms of development project for territories. And we are also, uh, the other way around, concerned with uh, the uh, importance of uh, setting this national transition in a European and uh, world perspective, especially uh, when it comes to uh, uh, sharing, uh, sharing of resources, for instance. Uh, and as regards the time frame, uh, the, uh, I mean, we, we are developing some modeling beyond 2050, but 2050 is still the, uh, uh, the uh, deadline, the uh, final uh, point for uh, assessing. Uh, the change of the system. I say still is because that was already the case in our first scenarios 20 years ago. Uh, and obviously that leaves uh, less time for uh, transforming the system, but we have no choice as uh, 2050 is uh, the deadline for meeting carbon neutrality uh, and uh, still uh, consistent if we can with uh, 1.5 degrees uh, objectives. Um, the uh, modeling uh, is very, uh, I mean, again, not getting in details. Uh, I have just uh, two things to say there. Uh, it's uh, simulation modeling. There's no optimization uh, uh, like black box uh, in the system. It's really a hands-on uh, modeling, but very detailed. Um, we start with uh, f uses in, in terms of energy services delivered and uh, go backwards in our modeling through to uh, uh, primary resources. Um, and uh, maybe uh, another uh, important thing to uh, emphasize, it's uh, that it is a physical modeling. We are modeling changes in uh, physical use of resources, physical transformation, and physical uh, services delivered to uh, end users. Uh, we don't put any economic signal in our modeling. And the reason is, if we put economic signals and try to uh, uh, like represent the economic system as it is, I mean, that's the best way not to get to a sustainable uh, 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 pathway because the energy system is not putting us right now on the right track. So what we say is it's much easier to negotiate or transform economic rules than physical ones. So we make sure we have a pathway that makes sense from a physical point of view. And then it is a, a starting point to discuss economy. And we have a, a part of a, a economic modeling, but it's really um, uh, ex post uh, analysis that we do. Um, I, uh, yeah. Uh, well, that, that is about uh, uh, modeling techniques, if you want. Uh, 
many models are very elaborate ones with a lot of equations uh, embedded. And, uh, and uh, most of these models are working uh, through what is called an optimization function. For instance, you represent in your model all the uh, energy use, economy, uh, like you, you can represent uh, households uh, and how they consume energy and what for and so on. And then you will ask your model to uh, produce a trajectory with that, that is uh, optimized uh, for uh, the least cost to achieve a certain level of greenhouse gas emission reduction, for instance. But it's, it, it's, it's the model that will computize the, uh, the uh, trajectory and the results based on the uh, assumptions or objectives you will put in it. Uh, and given the complexity of the system, I mean, either you keep it too simple compared to that complexity, uh, you don't get into enough detail, and then you, you can still understand what, what your model is doing, but uh, it's, it's not providing very uh, relevant or concrete results, or you get to a, to a much deeper level of complexity and detail, but then you are at risk of losing grasp of the consistency of what the model is doing. Um, and, and moreover, I mean, most of these optimization models are based on costs. And as I said, we don't, we don't uh, believe in a cost optimization based on an, in achieving a sustainable pathway based on cost optimization that is built on the basis of existing, uh, existing prices, existing uh, uh, incentives for investments. And, and I mean, when you look at uh, how uh, major environmental externalities are not reflected in prices, and when you look at how uh, the uh, market is uh, driving investors to uh, short term uh, to, to choices with the highest uh, short term return of investment, for instance. I mean, just, for, just with those two uh, uh, economic mechanisms, you, you just get away from what we call a sustainable pathway. Mm. It's, it's uh, as I said, it's open. It's a simulation uh, model, so uh, the constraints are those that we put in it. So we we we, uh, we, we start with the existing situation. We uh, really uh, represent it in uh, in uh, with, with a lot of detail in uh, in our model, and then we describe changes. Uh, through uh, like, uh, you know, improvement of the efficiency of, uh, of appliances and uh, how uh, and, 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 uh, the uh, change of the uh, appliances stock. Uh, changes in urban planning that will allow to reduce the census covered uh, from a house to work, for instance. And I mean, we, we take all those parameters and we, we, we have them, uh, we, we change them through time, making sure, of course, that uh, all these changes are consistent, um, and uh, this leads us to some results in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, raw material consumption, and when we get to results that seem good enough to us, we, c I, I mean, and, and have having uh, you know balanced all the uh, leverages and so on. I mean that what that is what we consider optimization. I'm, I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to uh, keep time uh, taking all those questions, but go on. I mean, I, I, I like it that it's interactive. Interact you guys with. design the energy system and then assess the effects with the model. The model does not design the energy system, right? We the model uh, rather describes that designs the energy system. And, and then, I mean, it's the assumptions and the changes we implement in our simulation system that design the change of the system. And what we do is, through those uh, models, we, uh, we, we assess 
uh, impact in terms of global energy consumptions, greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, raw materials. Uh, we can assess air pollution to some extent. We have a, a, a small, uh, well, complex, but uh, uh, dedicated uh, modeling of uh, the uh, balance of uh, the electric system on a wholly basis all along to 2050. Uh, and then we can apply some uh, bottom-up calculations on capex, opex uh, of the system. And therefore, uh, we, uh, I mean, we can demonstrate that our, uh, our uh, scenario is uh, less costly than uh, others that are promoted by other players. We can demonstrate that it creates jobs, for instance, but we don't have a macroeconomic uh, uh, modeling or, uh, or uh, assessment of the, uh, of the model. Um, so, yeah, I was uh, referring earlier on uh, to uh, the uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals matrix. Um, this graph is uh, what we drew from uh, the uh, special report on 1.5 degrees scenarios that the IPCC published in 2018. Um, there was a complete chapter dedicated to that issue that I mentioned, that uh, we need to uh, be very careful to uh, develop uh, synergies rather than trade-offs between uh, action on climate change and other uh, sustainable development goals. And this is a summary of the uh, kind of, of uh, rating of uh, 23 options for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the face of the whole set of sustainable development goals. The, uh, uh, the IPCC uh, made a comprehensive review of literature and gave scores. And we just uh, added the scores so that we have these results. The higher the score, uh, the most, uh, the, the highest, uh, uh, the, the better the impact of any option on sustainable development goals. I'm just showing this on the, on the global scale. I will uh, comment two things. First, actions on demand are in general more uh, positive for uh, sustainability uh, than, uh, than uh, others. Um, I just want to uh, mentioned that nuclear power here has the lowest score of all the options and it's very low compared to electric renewables. So when I will tell you later on on uh, uh, why we uh, prefer uh, renewables than uh, nuclear power when it comes to sustainability, there is some background there. Um, but the, 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 the main thing is uh, both in terms of, uh, I mean, in terms of um, intrinsic performance on sustainability, which is the, uh, uh, the middle bar for, uh, for uh, each of the options, uh, the uh, impact might be very different. And you have some uh, like margin of uh, impact bars uh, around the central value for, uh, for each, which shows that some, uh, some options I mean, the positive impact on sustainability of, sub, of some options is much more dependent on the conditions of implementation than others. And that is true, for instance, for uh, those that uh, relate to uh, the uh, uh, carbon nexus uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 bioresources. Yes? Very good question. What is the BECCS? Uh, BECCS means bioenergy uh, carbon capture and storage. So it's about raising forests, cutting them, burning it instead of coal or, uh, or uh, oil, and capturing the carbon. Some scenarios uh, are seriously considering bringing this on a global level um, uh, on a scale that is kind of equivalent in terms of carbon uh, handled to uh, the uh, oil and gas uh, industries today. And I mean, some of the scenarios which uh, don't want to uh, grasp on the uh, demand side issue, uh, especially, or that are uh, 
uh, less confident than others on uh, the uh, potential of renewables. Uh, I mean, they bet on technological options, and BEX is the uh, most uh, uh, prominent one. And, and so uh, you, you, you have scenarios which uh, uh, pretend that we can meet 1.5 objective by like, somehow keeping the system as it is, making it a bit uh, more performant, innovating, and uh, waiting for the second half of the century where we, when we implement so much BEX that we just uh, capture and put on the ground all the carbon we have emitted and at the end, it's fine. Okay, we uh, very much prefer something where uh, we uh, get safer earlier. Um, and this analysis really uh, was, uh, was uh, very important for us to uh, develop what we call a systemic merit order, which is the kind of merit order of the different options regarding their systemic impact. Uh, so sustainability is a large part of it, but uh, we also take into account scalability of options uh, with the idea that might be counterintuitive, but that is demonstrated in uh, scientific literature that uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the smaller the granularity of an option is, so the more diffuse the uh, implementation is, the faster it could massify. So opposite the idea that we have that big projects are what we should focus on. Um, so again, demand side or very decentralized uh, energy system m can be implemented much faster because you get a lot more of uh, players and stakeholders involved at the same time. Um, we also have a cautious approach on uh, innovation. Uh, and thank you for the question about BEX. Typically, we don't, uh, we don't uh, uh, take options like BEX in our scenario. Uh, we consider that we should only uh, foresee in, our, uh, in, in, in the pathway uh, some technical options that are mat mature enough. That doesn't mean they need to be uh, uh, ready uh, on, a, on an industrial level right now, but they need to be uh, uh, further enough in uh, terms of uh, maturity scales, and they are uh, very standardized uh, uh, scaling systems on the international level that allow to assess that. Uh, they need to be advanced enough so that we can be confident that they will be developed and they can be developed in a time frame that is consistent with the uh, objectives. Uh, on top of that, we are uh, also adding a caution, a caution on the uh, environmental and social effects, uh, which leads us to uh, consider that uh, we uh, need not, to, we, we shouldn't take into account um, options uh, which the uh, social and environmental impacts are not uh, assessed and are not uh, guaranteed uh, enough for the time being. Um, I'm coming. I'm, I, how much time do I, do I have left? Not much. 20? OK. Uh, I'm coming to um, uh, a more detailed analysis of what we call sufficiency. Uh, it's uh, very uh, important if we, if, we want to, uh, uh, if we want to see some progress of implementation of sufficiency in policies. We need to be more concrete about what this means and how it could be implemented. I'm not going to uh, get into details of policy making, but I want here to uh, emphasize that there are different levels of sufficiency which you could think of. The first one is what we call servicial sufficiency. It is what the French government has called for, for instance, last year uh, when uh, we were uh, afraid of energy shortages because of the uh, uh, of the problems of the uh, French nuclear system and uh, the uh, impact of the, uh, uh, of the uh, situation in Ukraine. Uh, that is about like, being more moderate in the way we are using existing equipments, vehicles, buildings and so on. Um, that is therefore something that is still, to some extent, uh, in your hands. You know, uh, uh, a lot of players tend to uh, reduce uh, sufficiency to uh, individual behavior 
or, uh, or uh, responsible behavior or behavior change and, uh, and put the burden of change on the shoulders of individuals. Uh, it can work for uh, what we call servicial uh, sufficiency <coughs> to some extent. When uh, I will start to talk about dimensional sufficiency, then it's more difficult. That is about the size of the buildings, the size of our equipments, the size of our vehicles. And you can see, for instance, that shifting from big cars that we are using nowadays, I mean, we, uh, we are driving cars which weigh more than one ton and are designed to uh, drive like uh, 100 km per hour with five people in, a, in there, in them. We are using them 90% of the time alone at 30 km in, 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 in cities. So, I mean, that is a completely crazy loss of resources, a completely crazy impact on land use. Uh, some people uh, have uh, estimated that in, in Paris, in Tramuros, cars uh, use more space than inhibitants. Okay? Um, so we, it, it really makes sense to shift to smaller cars and also to shift to very small cars that we could share in very urban uh, uh, conditions like in Paris, but uh, maybe uh, being a way to uh, uh, rent uh, a bigger car uh, when on some occasions we need it. And we think that this uh, would be a, a very relevant way to make from the shift to electric car a real opportunity to change our relationship to car. Because uh, what I said earlier on uh, how uh, care, uh, how, how the, this construction of mobility around cars was framing a lot of things in our, uh, in our lives. Um, it is to, one hand, to, to, to some extent some freedom, you know, individual freedom to move, but it's a real dependency on the, uh, at the same time. So keeping some freedom while reducing the dependency would be a good idea. But you can see that this kind of change, structural change of our mobility system is not something that we can individually decide. So we need policies to uh, be able to implement. And uh, similarly, when we are talking about uh, organization, organizational uh, sufficiency, sorry, uh, I mean, part of it might be simple, like sharing appliances, uh, sharing, uh, sharing uh, drills, okay? Uh, but if we want to share cars, if we want to share some spaces in our uh, collective housing, if you want to uh, get to uh, co-working spaces, develop co-living, uh, if we want to uh, change the, the uh, orientations of urban planning to do the contrary of what was done over the past uh, half century, which has extended distances we need to cover on a daily basis uh, to get to uh, work, to get to uh, services, to get to shops and so on. If we want to uh, reduce those distances, again, that is really not something that, is, uh, that, that people could uh, implement uh, themselves. So we need a lot of, uh, of uh, sufficiency policies. And the good news is that there are a lot of ideas. There are a lot of policies already uh, in place in, uh, in, in some places. Um, and obviously, we uh, also need, of course, to uh, think about sufficiency on food and goods because sustainability is not only about energy, but materials and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, a lot of them coming from, uh, from uh, our uh, agriculture. Um, another important perspective I want to give on sufficiency is uh, not, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, a kind of global and political one. This is the uh, definition IPCC coined for the first time in uh, its latest report uh, of uh, sufficiency, and uh, I uh, see the opportunity to say we are quite proud that uh, in one of this uh, report chapter on building, uh, there is a reference to uh, Negawatt as being pioneer in developing this sufficiency uh, efficiency uh, substitution approach. 
Um, but what uh, uh, we uh, think is very good in that definition is first that it's not only about energy, it's avoiding demand for energy, materials, land and water, so all resources. Uh, but even more importantly, it's about delivering human well-being, so that relates to services as I described them, within planetary boundaries. And that is uh, uh, very much related to uh, the uh, donut economy, if you've seen uh, this already, with this idea of uh, uh, a ceiling of global consumption and a floor of uh, fulfilling individual needs or decent living conditions. And this really brings us today to uh, two uh, uh, different areas uh, or of uh, reflection, different but not completely distinct because uh, 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 there, there are uh, some links. I won't, I won't get into, uh, into that discussion, but one is uh, the idea that when we prioritize services, we can collectively decide uh, which uh, of uh, them we want to reinforce. And for instance, reduce energy poverty is part of a sufficiency policy. Uh, and uh, though that we want to reduce, like driving alone uh, with a SUV uh, in Paris, for instance. Um, and we, we can all agree, not, not necessarily on which level we put any given service, but we will mostly agree on their ranking. If I tell you about uh, cooking your food or heating your home and taking a plane to go uh, in uh, Barcelona for a weekend, I'm sure we will all agree on the priority. Uh, so we can uh, discuss on uh, uh, a fairer distribution of access to services within collective limits. It is. I mean, sufficiency is intrinsically a democratic uh, issue because we need that discussion, but that discussion could really help uh, reshaping the system. The second uh, area of discussion, of course, is economics. Um, and I already told you we uh, don't believe in, a real, in, in ac current economics to deliver on deep sustainability, uh, but that means we need to rethink our economy. We have always uh, declined to uh, enter, uh, to, to engage in a growth, degrowth debate, mostly because to start with, we think uh, GDP is a really stupid indicator. I mean, uh, some of the examples I gave you in the uh, energy chain at the beginning, GDP would like it. I mean, the, 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 the light that is turned on in daylight, GDP likes it. Okay, so uh, but what we, 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 we rather think of it in terms of post-growth economy and uh, our uh, really uh, key word is that we need to uh, develop businesses that create or align uh, value creation with protection and sharing of resources while nowadays the most uh, performing economy or the business models are those that don't pay for uh, predating and destroying resources. So, again, we need a, a deep shift there. Um, faster on efficiency, uh, we consider the uh, importance of grey energy, which is about reducing the uh, consumption of energy to manufacture goods or build, uh, build uh, buildings and so on. So, uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, changes in processes, a lot of recycling, practices that could be implemented there. Um, then uh, the uh, uh, performance in delivering useful energy uh, and that, uh, for instance, touches on the issue of the uh, performance, the uh, thermal performance of buildings, which is a, a key for uh, energy transition. Then uh, when it comes to final energy and its conversion, that's heating systems, uh, uh, car engines, um, all our uh, appliances and uh, we have good examples with uh, energy labeling of uh, improvement of the uh, efficiency of uh, appliances for instance so that is another lever and we can have also some action on the primary energy level 
That is, for instance, what is called combined heat and power when you use uh, energy to, uh, when you burn some energy to, uh, uh, to generate electricity. There are a lot of uh, heat losses and you could use them uh, to feed local industrial processes or to feed, uh, uh, or to feed uh, heat, um, uh, sorry, uh, heat grids, urban heat grids, sorry. Um, so that were our uh, two uh, first steps. The last one is substitution and uh, I uh, already hinted on uh, what are our choices here, but uh, we uh, clearly uh, consider that the main difference that makes some uh, energy resources much more sustainable than others is that they are, some are based on stocks that are depleting, uh, that fossil fuels and uh, nuclear power, while some are based on flows that they are just using. Um, and this illustrates how much energy flow is theoretically available to be used uh, to, uh, to, to, to fill our energy needs. So this big, uh, uh, big uh, volume is the tot represents the total amount of energy that is received on Earth's surface every year. Um, and that small one is the energy we are using as human beings. Um, so what it says, it's not a matter of availability, it's a matter of our capacity to use this very diffuse energy in a way that is as efficient as when we uh, burn uh, geolog geological stocks. And the good news is uh, that probably thanks to the uh, industrial revolution that has burned most of these fossil fuel stocks, we are now in a capacity to use renewable energies in a as efficient or even more efficient way uh, than we did with fossil fuels. Um, I'm coming now to the uh, main uh, uh, or orientations of the uh, scenario, but I, I'll go fast to come to results and, and, and say something about the European one. Um, so you will get all the details in the, in the, in the slides, but... Uh, uh, for buildings, we have a lot of assumptions on uh, stabilizing, for instance, uh, uh, square meters uh, per, uh, per person, uh, uh <coughs> decreasing uh, the rate of uh, new builds, uh, and uh, of course, uh, a lot of assumptions on reasonable sizing, reasonable number, rate, uh, and reasonable use of, equi of uh, our uh, appliances. Efficiency is mostly about this thermal retrofitting of uh, uh, the existing stock. M most, roughly 90% of the uh, buildings of 2050 already exist, which means that, uh, of course, we uh, need to be, uh, uh, to be uh, very uh, uh, strong on the uh, level of performance of new buildings, but we mostly need to retrofit the existing, and we, when we retrofit, we need to do it right we need to go for a, a deep retrofitting of buildings otherwise you miss the uh, the uh, final target um, and uh, i mean we have a lot of assumptions on uh, substitution but for instance uh, we uh, foresee uh, an increasing use of heat pumps which become very performant when you use them in deeply retrofitted buildings so it comes together uh, for transport, uh, we have again a lot of uh, sufficiency uh, assumptions, reductions like 15% reduction in distance traveled, mostly as I said through uh, better urban planning uh, over time. Uh, some model shift, but car s is still dominant. Uh, reduction in air travel because that is an area where we, do we don't have a substitution uh, option available soon enough. Uh, an increase in vehicle occupancy rate. One of, one of our members has developed uh, a startup which is called ECOV, which is developing uh, um, uh, car sharing la uh, lanes. And uh, one of his uh, main arguments, which I really love, is uh, on rush hour, 
there are 60 million empty seats going on in our road, on our roads. 60 million, okay? Shows what potential we have to do uh, much better. Um, efficiency, of course, uh, improved performance and lighter vehicles. I already uh, mentioned this. And substitution for uh, electricity. Uh, we have the same kind of assumptions for uh, the uh, transported tonnage. I mean, we reduce uh, obsolescence of goods, for instance, or, uh, or, uh, or uh, inflating um, packaging and so on. So we reduce the uh, number of uh, the volume of goods that needs to be uh, transported. There's some model shift and a better filling rate of trucks uh, with the same logic uh, as for cars. Um, and again, for the trucks, uh, an improved performance. Uh, we don't think that electrifying all trucks is a good idea especially from a uh, raw material per, uh, perspective, like either uh, copper, if you want to put them on electric wires. Some people are uh, thinking of, you know, uh, electric motorways uh, to get trucks running. Either that or you uh, equip them with really big batteries and then you have a lithium issue. Uh, but uh, we uh, consider that we need to keep some... Uh, uh, some fuel in trucks, and that would be renewable gas. Uh, for the industry, again, a lot of sufficiency-related uh, assumptions uh, and efficiency through improvement of industrial processes uh, and innovation regarding the kind of material that could be used, so use of biomaterials instead of uh, plastics, for instance, and reduction of the uh, overall uh, footprint. Uh, some assumptions again on uh, substitution uh, and uh, we uh, also used all this uh, reasoning to uh, discuss how how much of the industry could be relocalized so how how this could fit with a reindustrialization uh, uh, project and uh, for instance i mean we we don't we, we didn't go through all sectors of course that is an ongoing work but for instance for textile we consider that we could, by 2050, reduce by 30% the overall volume of textile use um, with a 30% increase in value, uh, in, in, uh, value per unit because of higher quality. So that means the uh, global economic volume is stable. Higher quality means uh, local production can uh, gain competitiveness and we can uh, raise the uh, share of local production in that consumption. And higher quality plus local production means a lot more could be recycled, and we get from less than 10% to 50% recycled by 2050. So that's just an example of how you could bring all these ideas uh, together to uh, make sense for uh, uh, an economic sector. Um, I'm just not... Uh, detailing at all this uh, uh, agriculture and forestry uh, uh, assumptions, just to say that we, uh, we are uh, concerned and very cautious about uh, uh, the uh, evolution of uh, natural, uh, uh, natural uh, greenhouse gas sinks and with uh, how forests forest could uh, cope with climate change and how we can increase uh, our use of uh, wood for uh, materials, energy, and so on, while protecting forest against uh, the uh, stress of uh, climate change. But that, there's a lot of discussion beyond that. And when it comes to uh, the uh, energy resources we are using in the scenario, uh, the first uh, important message is that although uh, the uh, debate is focusing on renewable, on electric renewables, we should not forget the role of biomass. Only 25% of our energy goes through electricity today, which means that uh, we uh, have 75% uh, where we need to change, either to keep combustion, but then substitute fossil fuel combustion by biomass, or uh, substitute combustion uh, by electrification. But it's better if you keep both options and combine them than if you go for electrification alone. So we need biomass and we use it. 
but in a way that uh, doesn't mean to, uh, uh, to uh, allocate uh, land to this uh, biofuel uh, production. So we are only using uh, uh, intermediary uh, culture or uh, uh, byproducts or uh, waste. Uh, then we develop, of course, uh, renewables, uh, mostly uh, wind power and photovoltaics. And for wind power, for instance, to give you an idea of the uh, level of pressure that uh, our scenario means, uh, we uh, go from something like 9,000 uh, wind turbines today to... Uh, uh, um, uh, 18... Yeah, 18,500, uh, I think. Uh, so that's roughly doubling. That is to be compared to uh, more than 27,000 already existing in Germany, which, is, which has a smaller territory. So we don't saturate uh, landscapes. Um, and of course, we are uh, considering uh, a bit of other energies, but not that much, especially we don't consider marine energy because it's not mature enough. We can have good surprises in the uh, coming decade, but for the time being, we don't want to bet on that. Uh, <coughs> with that increase of renewables comes a strong decrease of uh, fossil fuel and a phase out uh, of uh, fossil fuel, progressive, but uh, fast enough to uh, be uh, in line with the carbon budget. There's no temporary increase, of course, in the scenario. Uh, and uh, we uh, only keep a small uh, consumption of uh, fossil fuels for non-energetic uses, like as, as a raw material in uh, industrial processes. Um, finally, uh, for the trajectory, we uh, aim for a so-called controlled nuclear descent. As I already said, we consider that because of its, int its intrinsic risks, uh, nuclear power is less sustainable than renewables. And the good news for us is that renewables are today most uh, effective to, uh, to uh, deploy than nuclear, than particularly new nuclear. So we don't uh, include any new reactor in our scenario and we focus on uh, managing the existing fleet and uh, making the uh, uh, phase out as smooth, flexible and uh, under control as possible from the perspective of electric security, but also uh, the uh, piling up of uh, raw nuclear materials, uh, the uh, social impact of shutting down plants, of course, with the uh, local jobs and, uh, and so on. Um, <coughs> this is just about the evolution of the... Uh, yeah, okay. I'm just curious, have you only made like one scenario? Yes. Okay, so you don't like have multiple... No. No, as I said, we, we, we are using our modeling to develop what we consider at, at some point the optimal combination of leverages to meet sustainable objectives. No, so it, 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 can, it can evolve and, and, and we could do like, you know, uh, uh, some, uh, I mean, we do some sensitivity analysis, of course. And we, uh, we, we, we try different balances between leverages, but um, we, uh, uh, we think it's much more effective in uh, the uh, political debate to have one scenario, which we don't put as you know, the uh, only possible road, but we, we, which we uh, introduce as a reference to compare other roads with, uh, then to uh, multiply the, uh, the options. Okay. And there, there are many players in France that develop different scenarios, so uh, it's not like if that it was this scenario alone. Um, so yeah, so this is just about the evolution of uh, electric consumption. I'm not getting into details. The main message is, uh, also, although we are electrifying uses, like all scenarios uh, nowadays, um, because there is a lot of sufficiency and efficiency implemented, uh, there's a, a reduction by 10% roughly of electric demand, although uh, the need for electricity increases because we need hydrogen for uh, other uh, uses. 
Uh, and uh, an important uh, item is that we reduce peak demand, which today uh, uh, some, sometimes reaches 90 gigawatts to compare to 61 gigawatt of nuclear power, for instance. Uh, 19 gigawatt of which 30 gigawatt of, uh, of uh, heat, electric heating in, uh, in, in winter time. We reduce it to 60 gigawatt, which obviously changes the, uh, the uh, dimensioning of the uh, electric security issue. And this comes with uh, some uh, 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 shift to 100% renewables. And we are, we, as I already said, we have uh, checked through uh, modeling that it is consistent with uh, the uh, security of the system. Uh, main results uh, is through sufficiency and efficiency and increase of renewables, we shift from a current situation where the uh, uh, share of renewables in uh, energy consumption is very low to uh, situation where uh, we reach 100% of local supply by uh, renewables, thanks to a threefold, roughly, increase of renewables and a twofold reduction of uh, uh, final energy consumption, combining sufficiency and efficiency. So this is what it looks in terms of uh, energy supply. It comes, of course, with uh, carbon neutrality that was uh, core objective, uh, cl climate neutrality uh, by 2050 or earlier. Uh, and it comes with a strong reduction of our raw materials footprint, roughly by 30%, uh, with a decrease on almost all materials and some uh, where we see some increase. Bauxite, which provides aluminium because there's a substitution of uh, uh, copper by aluminium for the uh, electric system and lithium for uh, batteries. Um, we introduce in our scenario a criteria of keeping the accumulated consumption of any raw material under 1% of the proven reserves today. Which means, because the 1% is roughly the share of French population in uh, the world population, so that is a way to make sure our scenario doesn't mean increased extractive pressure. Uh, and I mean, we, we, we keep well below that 1% for most materials. Lithium is really one of the very few where we uh, touch on that limit, which means that any scenario that would not encompass all the sufficiency assumptions we make on the number of vehicles, their size, uh, the, uh, the sharing uh, and the distances covered because uh, thanks to that urban planning will go beyond that threshold. Last year, the uh, French uh, uh, government produced, uh, produced intermediate results where uh, they said if we go for our, mob electrifying, uh, our plan for electrifying mobility, France will need 5% of world lithium production by 2030. That, in our view, is not reasonable. Um, we uh, checked, and I don't discuss that, uh, the uh, positive impact on many uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, sustainable objectives, like six, uh, 600,000 uh, job creations, for instance, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and if I can just take a few minutes for the uh, European scenario, I'm not, I, I know I'm... Two or three. Um, <laughs> so uh, this clever scenario I uh, mentioned means uh, collaborative low energy vision for the European region. Uh, we developed it uh, in uh, collaboration with a network of uh, more than uh, 25 partners in uh, 20 countries, uh, bottom up starting with national trajectories and aggregating and harmonizing them on the European level, based, of course, of, on, the, on the same uh, logic uh, as the uh, Negawatt scenario, which we shared, discussed, and adjusted uh, with them. And uh, with that vision of uh, uh, meeting uh, both climate urgency and energy sovereignty uh, objectives on the short and uh, long term, we show that, uh, I mean, Europe can meet 
uh, its uh, carbon budget in line with the 1.5 uh, degree uh, objective. It can reduce, as in the French scenario, its final consumption by 50%, get to 100% renewables, and that is uh, thanks uh, mostly to uh, uh, sufficiency. I just wanted to show you uh, this we discussed, and, and that, that's part of the uh, uh, interesting uh, things in uh, scaling up to the European level. Of course, when you talk about sufficiency with people in uh, Germany or in Bulgaria or Romania, I mean, the conversation is different. Uh, so we took into account the need for uh, 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 less advanced or less developed economies uh, in Europe to catch up. And uh, you can see here the difference it brings in the level of energy reduction in different countries. In other words, energy services increase in some countries, like kilometers covered per person, uh, in our scenario to, uh, uh, to get to a, a better balance. And uh, we also work on how countries could share potentials and limitations in terms of renewables, for instance, or, uh, or, ca or natural carbon sinks so that this sharing makes it much easier to, bring, to reach the objectives than if each country is trying to get to uh, like national sovereignty or climate neutrality by itself. Um, it, we, we, we showed on the European level that it can have the same kind of uh, very positive impact than uh, the uh, French one and finally uh, we, uh, of course, uh, bring some recommendation that sufficiency first should be the principal leading European uh, energy uh, policy and that comes with uh, a lot of uh, specific objective and uh, our demand with our partners that Europe should mainstream sufficiency and I just want to conclude with that graph because uh, we uh, hear a lot that people are not ready for sufficiency, that it is uh, limitation of freedom, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this shows the share of sufficiency related uh, items in policies in the uh, national plans uh, of uh, different uh, governments and the share of sufficiency related recommendations in citizens' assemblies or deliberating uh, processes. So you can see the difference in the we took from this that people are much more ready if they are guaranteed to be accompanied to have alternatives and to get some co-benefits, much more ready for sufficiency and energy transition that policymakers tend or pretend to think. Thank you.